Lift and drag are two forces which act on an airplane in flight. Two others, weight and thrust, complete the pattern. To understand the nature of the force which moves an airplane forward through the air, we will first consider thrust. When a skater throws a baseball, the reaction to the throw causes him to move in the opposite direction. In all means of locomotion, thrust is produced by throwing or pushing something backward. When a train moves forward, it is really pushing the earth backward very slightly. If instead of the real train, we use a model and represent the earth with this bicycle wheel, the respective weights are about equal. Then the effect can be clearly seen. When things try to move through a liquid, they can no longer push the solid earth. They can push some of the liquid back. A paddle steamer pushes back the surrounding water and the reaction sends the steamer forward. Particles of water are thrown backward and the steamer moves forward. As for liquids, so for gases. The gas filling this balloon is made up of millions of tiny particles. If the balloon is released, these particles are forced backward, and the reaction causes the balloon to fly forward. The principle is the same as for the boy throwing his ball. Exactly the same principle applies to the airplane. The job of the propeller is to accelerate air backward. Millions of tiny particles in a constant stream in the same way as does this electric fan. The reaction causes the plane to move forward. The jet is another device for doing the same thing. Air is drawn in through the intakes, heated, and forced out at the rear as a constant stream of particles. Once again, the reaction results in the planes moving. But just as the boy could only keep on going as long as he had a constant supply of baseballs, and a boat is able to move only so long as there is water, so the propeller and the jet must have a continuous supply of air to accelerate backwards. Near the ground, there is no problem. There is always plenty of air. The jet or propeller-driven airplane depends on this surrounding air in order to fly. The higher it gets, however, the thinner the atmosphere becomes until eventually there is no air, nothing at all to throw backwards. If we want to travel through this empty space beyond the Earth's atmosphere, we must carry a supply of something to throw backwards. The rocket is the answer. The rocket carries its own fuel and its own air. But for the airplane, as well as the rocket, and for all methods of propulsion, the fundamental principle remains the same. Accelerate something backward, a bicycle wheel, a baseball, water, or air, and we find the reaction will cause the object to move in the opposite direction. To this force, we give the name thrust. Together with others, drag, weight, and lift, it acts on an airplane in flight and moves it forward through the air which surrounds the Earth.
An airplane flying straight and level at constant speed is, as we know, being acted upon by a number of forces. The structure, the engines, the crew, everything has weight distributed all over the aircraft, trying to pull it down. The force of lift created by the wings as they move through the air is keeping the airplane up. The propellers are creating thrust and pulling the airplane along. All parts of the airplane, which are in the airflow, are creating various forms of drag, trying to pull it backward. Let us then consider weight, which together with lift, thrust, and drag, is a principal force affecting the flight of an airplane. This piece of cardboard can be freely suspended from a point. It will hang in one position only. It reacts as though all its weight is along a vertical line passing through the point of suspension. If it is suspended from a different point, it still acts in the same kind of way. If the card is suspended at the crossing point of these two lines, it will hang in any position, as though all its weight acted through this point. This is called the card's center of gravity. The center of gravity of an airplane can also be determined. In flight, it will behave as though all its weight acted through this point. So weight can be represented like this. The magnitude of the weight can be shown by the length of the arrow. In the same sort of way, lift, thrust, and drag can be represented, though the forces may not be in exactly this proportion. So an airplane is being pulled by two pairs of forces simultaneously. This rope is being pulled by a pair of forces. So long as they are of the same magnitude, the rope stays in equilibrium. But it would still be in equilibrium if it were moving at constant speed. The airplane, then, is in equilibrium. But if one force gets larger than the other, the rope ceases to be in equilibrium. When opposing forces acting on an object are not equal, the object changes its state of motion. For instance, it may accelerate. When it stops accelerating, it will run at constant speed. Now it's in equilibrium again. But when an unbalanced force like this comes into play, the object decelerates and finally stops. In the case of the airplane, if one of the forces is greater than the opposing force, if the pilot opens the throttle and thrust gets bigger than drag, for instance, the airplane accelerates. Or if thrust gets smaller than drag, the airplane decelerates. The same sort of thing applies to lift and weight. In fact, to secure level, constant speed flight, each force must be equal to its opposing force. Lift must equal weight, and thrust must equal drag. But of course, lift is not equal to drag, nor is thrust equal to weight. An efficient airplane needs to lift a big load and to have small drag. Its lift or weight may be 10 or more times as big as its thrust or drag. But in balanced flight, each force is equal to its opposing force. Lift is equal to weight, and thrust is equal to drag. For 
balanced flight, the forces must also act in the right places. The engines must be so placed that the total effect of thrust is along the center line of the aircraft. If, for example, a man rowing exerts equal thrust on each side of the center line, the boat goes straight. But if he exerts more thrust on one side than the other, the boat turns, so with an airplane. The airplane must be designed so that the total effect of drag is along the center line. Otherwise, the airplane then must be designed and rigged so that thrust and drag act along the center line of the fuselage. What about weight and lift? Weight, as we know, acts through the center of gravity. Lift, derived from the wings, acts through a point called the center of lift. Obviously, if these two points were wide apart, the airplane would tip. The airplane must be designed with the center of lift and the center of gravity close together. Normally, the center of gravity is just forward of center of lift so that the airplane can freely take up its gliding attitude. In this attitude, lift and drag combine to give a resultant force which supports the weight of the aircraft, maintaining its equilibrium in a glide. This is the normal flying attitude of the glider. But for normal flight in a powered aircraft, the tendency to tip nose down must be corrected. One way of doing this is by making thrust act below drag. So we must create conditions in which lift equals weight, thrust equals drag, and all four forces act in the right places in order to fly at constant speed, straight and level.